But when I'm consulting, we need to figure out who is the face, if they want to be the face, and are they trying to sell the product only, or are they trying to build a long-term relationship with the people that follow them? You're not looking for anybody to buy from you. You're just informing people of the process. Do you want to be that brand that everybody knows who you are, kind of that cheers mentality? Or do you want to be a brand that only just pushes their product? And that's what we need to figure out when we're sitting down with specific brands and trying to figure out their social strategy. Welcome to episode 111 of the AFT Construction Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Levitt. And in this episode, I speak with Jesse Fitton-Smith. And Jesse was a very amazing guest. I mean, Jesse has an incredible background in marketing, social media, YouTube, videography, photography. He, In fact, he does a lot of this work for us here at AFT behind the scenes. And so we were able to dive down how to advertise on Instagram. How do you build a following? What are the key strategies to do so? And he had some amazing insights on how to be successful and build your following and really give some sound advice. He also spoke about, you know, how does that marketing strategy work for your company? How should you position that and make that a goal? As all of us are busy, we all have responsibilities, but the importance of marketing is so key to our firm. And so you'll really enjoy all of the content, all the information Jesse has to offer. So without further ado, let's get started. So welcome to AFT Construction Podcast, Jesse. It's good to have you here in studio. It's it's definitely interesting to be on uh, on the mic with you. On this side of it, so Jesse and I go pretty far back. Actually, we met through social media, Jesse Finn-Smith. And just a quick background, Jesse uh, does videography, does photography, does social media, marketing, a whole list of other things. And we met through Instagram. I know you were running a page from one of the vendors we use. So how have you seen social media change? Man, it used to be that you would be able to actually post something and people would see it. Isn't that kind of funny? <laughs> like nowadays, you know, I, I feel like you're the only one that actually gets any traction on anything anymore. But ultimately, you know, you would, what, like 2008, 2009, when social media kind of hit its, you know, peak of being introduced into the market, uh, you would post one photo and thousands and thousands of people would see it and you could go viral very easily. And nowadays, you it's post really something difficult. and you get 37 likes and you have 35,000 followers. It's quite, it's quite difficult. And uh, man, it's the, the evolution of it is fascinating. It's a, very much a pay-to-play situation now rather than post it and because people like it, it gets pushed out to more people. It's, hey, you put it out. If you want it to do well, go ahead and put some money behind it. Well, it's interesting. I know you've worked with other brands, you know, managing their social media. And I know one of your strategies has been, which is a good strategy, is that, you know, when you're a company and you're looking to build it, especially today in 2021, right? Like it's not organic. And we could talk about TikTok and LinkedIn that are a little bit more organic still, but you know, when you're looking at Instagram, pay for play, if you're going to put dollars behind it, now you can cater that audience to the exact demographic you want for your product, but you also can do a demographic to just get followers, right? To build right. some credibility, if you will. I mean, as much as we use that word pretty loosely, but the reality is people with big Instagram followings, there are some credibility that comes with it. So you can cater that as, and I know that's something you should be, hey, if you want followers in Brazil or out of the country or India, right, where they are into architecture or design, you can cater a marketing campaign to that. Or if you're looking, hey, I just want to cater to Scottsdale, Arizona, which is where I'm based, you can do that. It's going to be a lot more money, less eyes, but you can still do that. Well, in, and in your situation, it's not about how many people see it. It's about the right people seeing it. And when you're working with different brands, you have to figure out what the most important thing is for them. So in your case, if you're going to target market people, you want to have people that are either looking for, you know, $3 million and above homes or 
have expensive taste in cars, jewelry, you know, handbags, whatever the case may be, you don't want the person that's looking for a $20,000 remodel. You want somebody that's going to build a $5 million home. And so when you're, when you're trying to tailor your, your ad demographic, when we're speaking as far as running an Instagram ad, it's extremely important to know who your, who your target market is. And if you don't know, then you're just kind of shooting for the stars. And, you know, when I worked with a brand, um, there was, it was like a kind of a, a nationwide or a global brand, and they wanted a bigger Instagram following. I was like, let's target India. Let's target these different areas of the world that have interest in our type of architecture or they look to America as this like dream escape and really pump a lot of money into into there cuz we can get you know followers if you want that vanity metric then we can get followers there rather than trying to pump a lot of money into you know Scottsdale or you know Idaho or you know any specific area it's going to cost more money here than anywhere else. So if you want that vanity metric, let's go for, you know, out of the country where we can get more bang for our buck. It's it's a really important concept to understand because as you mentioned, Jesse is, I mean, he used the term vanity metric, but there's some truth to that, right? There is some clout or vanity that comes with a big following and you can use that for different ways as you start building your brand. But what, but the key here is you said the right people and and really to understand your marketing strategy, because as you mentioned, if anyone that's gone through the pay for play with Instagram, as you put together a marketing or ad campaign, it'll tell you, hey, if I put $100 and I'm marketing to Phoenix and I want male and female 30 to 50 that make over X dollars household income, I can do that. And then it'll say, yeah, this, you know, there'll be 8,000 people that'll see this over the campaign. Or you take $100 in India. And put the campaign there, you know, maybe 30 to 50, no dollar range demographic, and it'll say 400,000 people will see that. And so when you're looking at that, really what it's telling you is, if I'm, if I'm using this marketing campaign for the 8,000, well, yeah, those are the core people and I'm hoping they see it. Maybe I get two or three followers, but it's probably going to be hopefully the ideal client, right? As opposed to the India one that it's going to go to 400,000 people but I'll probably get 300 followers and they're real followers. These are real people because it's through Instagram. It's not like I'm paying some bot, but they're not clients, but it's just adding to that metric, right? Of followers that I have as opposed to those I follow. Yeah. And like, I just saw a video today that was talking about hiring a, and hiring is a loose term, but basically paying somebody from like Fiverr to basically push out, they do a shout out. You know, shout outs used to actually mean something, but they don't really mean much now. But these people were doing shout outs on Fiverr to their audience of 300,000. And they're saying you could get X amount of followers. And the guy did it, he paid him like 15 bucks or something like that. And he got three followers from that shout out. And it, it just shows that like, even the Fiverr hire, you know, when you hire somebody from Fiverr or any of those other websites that do like the gig economy kind of stuff, you're not, you're still not getting your money's worth. And so running an ad through Instagram to gain followers, even though people will say you're buying followers, it's, it's a more legitimate way of getting to the right amount of people that you want for that vanity metric. Now, if you want specific followers and, you know, if you're a, a lighting company in the Phoenix metro area and you have a, a target demographic of people that are willing to put exterior lighting on their house for five to $10,000, then you have a very, like, geographically centered group of people that you want to communicate with 
So you're going to spend a lot more money to target those people. And if you don't target the right people, then you're not going to get the right client. And that a lot of people will get frustrated with running ads on Instagram because they didn't tailor it right or Facebook or any you know platform when you don't run the proper ad to the right amount of people or to the right demographic then you're not you're not going to get the leads that you wanted and leads are people so you're not going to get the right people right and and as you mentioned it's not so much you know paying for followers i mean you're paying ad campaigns it is pay for play and so when you look at the analytics of Instagram, for example, if I do, and, and for anyone listening, as you look at that, I mean, one of the drivers of a post is if you have a lot of saves, a lot of people save it, a lot of people forward that post, Instagram's tracking that and they say, okay, well, th- this post is really engaging because people are saving it to that idea book, they're forwarding it to friends. So, so there's something about this that's going to make it go you know, viral, if you will. And so what ends up happening is that even organically, you may have one out of 10, one out of a hundred that goes viral, right? That gains traction for whatever reason, that time of the day, people gravitated toward it and it did really well. I mean, there, there's no rhyme or reason typically because Instagram's such a, a, a changing commodity. But the reality is when you look at the analytics, um, as that post goes viral, then you get a lot of eyes that are people that didn't follow you, right? And then that's how your followers increase. And really what the pay for play does is, is it just opens that up. So instead of the luck of the draw, something goes viral. Well, now by paying for play, if you will, and you're advertising to India or US or Scottsdale or New York or where, wherever it is, you're opening up that up. And so when you look at your analytics, yes, paid posts always do better traffic wise than organic posts. And they always do. And that's why a lot of companies put money behind their social media because Uh, without calling out any brands, but national brands use social media. They pay for it. They advertise through it because they see it's going to cast a wider net. Well, and it the reason why brands are on social media is to make money. So like whenever I talk to somebody about this, like I'll, I'll go in for a potential client meeting and we'll start discussing, you know, what they really want. Like I always start out with like, what's your goal with social media? Are you wanting to gain that vanity metric or are you wanting to gain a higher bottom line? Um, In most cases, a business wants a higher bottom line. You know, they want to increase those sales. And if they don't increase the sales, they're going to feel like social media is a waste of time because it is, it's a time suck. And so if we don't actually see an increase, then we're just ultimately wasting our time. And I truly believe, like I'm like the CPA that doesn't want to give the government a bunch of tax dollars. I'm like the, you know, social media guy that really doesn't want to spend a lot of time on social media because I really truly feel that it's your credibility is in the work that you do, not in the photos that you post and what the followers you have. Yeah. Because really like I have on TikTok, I blew up um, really quickly and I'm totally stalled out, but I blew up super big in my eyes on TikTok and completely stalled out. I have 13,000 followers. I haven't made any more money from those followers than before when I had 20. And it's just, it's purely a vanity metric. I don't use it to promote myself. I don't use it for anything. I'm, I mainly just scroll through TikTok. But, you know, Instagram, I have, you know, 1,300. And I'll post a photo there and I'll get an inquiry. And it's worth my while because then those followers are actually helping me generate more money. And if I, if I don't post to Instagram, which I don't post often, I'm, you know, I won't, I won't see any inquiries. Yeah. It's an interesting mentality because this goes back to when you're thinking of your marketing campaign as a company, well, what's the right demographic? What's your strategy with social media? Then you take it a step further because there are a lot of platforms, right? We, we mentioned LinkedIn and Instagram, or I'm sorry, LinkedIn and TikTok that are still somewhat organic. You can go and you can create content and you can 
essentially go viral overnight. You can do really well on those platforms. Instagram and Facebook are a little bit more difficult. Pinterest, you can do really well. Um, you, you know, those are some of the platforms that use the follower mentality, right? But as you mentioned, is that when you're looking at your business, there's a lot of time vested in social media. So you're going to cater to the audiences where you're getting the most business. I've always been adamant that for me in the building industry, LinkedIn and Instagram have been the most beneficial, right? Right. I'm on TikTok. I post. We've, we've done okay. I've had a couple go viral, not much. But I've never had anyone, I've never had an inquiry from TikTok ever. Right. I know that there's an audience out there and some people are really leveraging that financially. But I look at Instagram and yeah, there is a, um, a base, there's content, there's followers, there's a community on LinkedIn and Instagram that continually network with me and reach out. And it's a business development arm of our company. Well, and for you, it's, you, we talk about this a lot. You are social on that platform. So LinkedIn and Instagram you are connected with people. You have like true friendships, true relationships with people. Like there's like the million dollar mindset um, Instagram account that like has loads of followers and they're always commenting on your stuff and you're commenting back. And it's like you have a relationship with almost a faceless brand in my in my eyes like you don't know who that individual is at least i don't know who that individual is you may but ultimately you have these you know brands or accounts that have huge numbers following and interacting with you because you first interacted with them and that just the same as any relationship that you have like when when i reached out to you through the porter barnwood account and was like hey I want to meet you. It wasn't because you were building houses. It was because I knew you were going to be a cool guy. And I was like, I got to be his friend. So <laughs> Sorry I'm to going disappoint to, you. <laughs> I'm going to, le- <laughs> I'm going to leverage my, you know, my relationship with Porter Barnwood to get to know you. And it's led to a lot of things that I never foresaw happening, you know, with our, with our, friendship and business relationship across the board. Well, it's interesting. You don't realize, you know, the, these channels of communication that do open, right? And, and I'll get back to that because uh, I think that's important for the conversation, how we met. But I remember sitting in, a, a, in the LinkedIn Global Summit and they said, when, when in the past could you go on any platform and message, direct message the CEO of any company, right? Big companies are on LinkedIn, right? These executives. You can target people and, and not just solicit them, but you can build a friendship. And one thing that's lost is people get connected on LinkedIn and then right away you send a direct message like, hey, I want to sell you this. Instead of take six months, build a rapport, support them, like all their posts, comment on them, right? And then that can open up into a friendship and a relationship. But going back to yours, I remember when we met, you said, let's meet. And then the first thing you said to me, you said, hey, you posted the same image and I posted it, you had like 80 comments, I had like two comments. How's that possible? And I remember saying, well, you know, there's, it's the reciprocity thing. You know, there's been time, there's friendships built where I have peers that'll post stuff, so I'll like and comment and save their post and, and they'll do the same. And so it takes time, you build these friendships and that's why social media, it's not just post and let it do its thing. Like there has to be a lot of back end behind the scenes that I'm doing the same thing for them that I would expect them to do for me. And then you can start building that traffic, that community, that now that community now turns into podcast interviews. It turns into networking opportunities at business conferences. It turns into, hey, Jesse, I'm struggling with this in my marketing strategy. I'm struggling with this. I need this house photographed. I need some video work done. Like, let's talk. And so all these things open up through these simple connections to Instagram or LinkedIn. Yeah. And what's really interesting to me is you're you're constantly on there. <laughs> Just it it's wild, but I also whenever I text you, you text me right back as well. So it's like you just constantly have that phone glued to your hand. But I can always count on seeing when I open up Instagram or I open up LinkedIn I can always 
guarantee that I'm going to see your image first. And that's because that it, it's, it's almost like Instagram or the AI of Instagram or LinkedIn is taking on a human relationship. Because what happens when something goes wrong? Who are you going to think of when you wake up and you're like, oh my goodness, I need to talk to this person? It's like you open up and you're like, oh my goodness, there's Brad again. I need to talk to him. And there's this constant reciprocity that they feed your photo to us because you first comment, you first like, you first save. And that makes a huge difference. And that's what builds true relationship. So like, ultimately, it all comes back to building a real relationship. So if you are marketing and running ads to people in India, you could actually really build relationships with those individuals and have friends in India that you can count on when you post a photo that they're going to respond, they're going to like, they're going to comment. And it's because those people are real and they want to truly have a reason to communicate with us because everybody desires to be known. So ultimately, when it comes to social media, people want to be known by each individual that likes, comments, or you know, posts a photo. Everybody wants that. Everybody wants to be Instagram famous or LinkedIn famous or TikTok famous. Everybody wants to be famous, and it's mainly because we all have this eagerness to be known. It's interesting, and and I think there are variations of that, right? And and you know, some people that may be a little bit more, um, I don't want to say lucid, but more recluse, right? More reclusive to others. But I will say a couple of points you made, Jesse. That's interesting is that there is, if if you're genuine about it, if you want to make real connections and and provide value to others there's a lot to be gained, right? That it's just, and, and I've seen that, that as people have reached out with questions and vice versa, you know, I find value in those relationships. I find value in those conversations. And even from a customer side, I, I had a customer, unbeknownst to me, unbeknownst to me, you know, a couple of years ago that they would reach out, hey, Brad, I really love this house. Like, and they'd ask questions about some of the design specs and the finishes. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd let them know where I could, you know, share some of the products and some of the information. And we kind of built this friendship. Well, they're ready to sell their house. You know, the, the, the road was widening. They sold their house, they're building a new one and they called me, right. We're going to build their house. And so you can plant these seeds and build these relationships over time. And so what I found is that, you know, going to a networking event in the past, it's really hard to target certain people you want to talk to. You only have so much time. They're talking to someone else. You may not know them. It's uncomfortable. Whereas social media is a quicker way where I could target. And I looked young in my career. There were certain architects, certain designers I wanted to work with. And I was a nobody, right? I'm starting AFT and I'm Brad. And they may have known me or known of me for the company I worked for before, but didn't really know me. I didn't have a relationship. I'm young. Didn't have a resume credibility. So as I supported them and engaged with them and then started building our reputation, you know, you catch their eye. Hey, Brad, what are you doing? I noticed you're doing this. Let's talk. Let's have lunch. And so it opens that channel in a very non-confrontational, non-soliciting way where now I can continue that conversation. Well, and that, and, you know, that's kind of how our relationship started. You know, like, hey, I see that you're doing this. Is there any way that we could add value to you? You know, and it's like, you're not sales pitch. I went to a wedding this past Saturday and there were loads of architects and home builders and stuff, which is really funny because it, I wasn't there because we got invited because we knew the, that all those people were going to be there. My wife's best friend was the bride. She just happens to be an interior designer, and they just happen to build homes. Um, and it turns out that, you know, a bunch of Phoenix area business or architects, builders, and designers were all there. And I, I could have like 
thrown myself out there and totally upset my wife. <laughs> <laughs> my wife would have lost it if I was uh, doing that. But like I, d- I held back. I didn't want to make it about me gaining business. I could have put myself out there. Oh, I do video and I do interiors photography and I, I do all of these X, Y, and Zs. I'll, I can manage social media and all this stuff. And I was like, no, I'm, I am here to support my friend, you know, my wife's friend who, you know, it's her lifelong friend. Um, I'm here to support them. I'm not here to sell what I do. Um, but hey, if you find me on Instagram, you could figure it out. If you, if you find me on TikTok, you could figure it out. But I'm, I'm such a low key person when it comes to trying to sell myself that I'll let you come find me rather than me putting myself out there so much that you don't know, you know, there's no other reason for you to think of anybody else. Maybe that's to my own fault. (laughs) Now we're super excited. Welcome one of our new sponsors to the podcast, Pella Windows. And this is even more exciting because we use Pella in so many of our projects, nearly all of them. And they've been just an incredible partner of ours. And locally, Sammy and Adam, they are not only amazing business partners behind us, but they are super close friends. And I speak on the podcast all the time about the importance of relationships, right? Relationships with our customers, with our vendors, with our suppliers, because at the end of the day, I'm only as good as those that help our brand and assist us in our projects to to take it from the ground up all the way to completion. And if we didn't have partners such as Pella, there's no way we'd be who we are today. Over the years, we've built this amazing relationship. When we call them or email them, they respond. They're quick. Their, Their company culture, their integrity, their honesty You know, they are always there to do what's right for us and the customer. They can do anything from small replacement projects to large custom homes and even multi-million dollar commercial projects. And also, when you think about their product line, they can do ultra contemporary, historical preservation, and large traditional projects. So for anyone, any scale, any size, they're the ones to call. They're here local. You know, they have an amazing Instagram. Make sure and give them a follow to see what they're doing. So if you need windows and doors, give Sammy and Adam a call. We stand behind Pella. We love what they do, their culture, their brand, and especially their quality. And if you want to learn more about Pella Windows, check our show notes. We'll have everything tagged there so you can give them a follow and have their contact information to reach out. And now let's get back into the episode. I love <laughs> that though. And, and here's, here's an important part to that, Jesse, is you look at that. Um, I, I'll, I'll give an example. You know, many years ago, uh, I had a neighbor and, you know, of course, in the conversation, me and your neighbor, new in our neighborhood, hey, what do you do for work? And you know, hey, I'm Brad. We build houses. You know, we do construction, commercial work. In one year, out the other, like they had no idea. I mean, for those of us in the field, you understand what a general contractor is, or an interior designer, or an architect. Like you have some understanding of what they do, what their role is. Maybe you ask them what their scope of work is. But to a lot of people, they don't understand. They don't know if I carry a hammer and I frame houses all day or what. I mean, to them, it's all the same. So fast forward, you know, we connected on LinkedIn. And every day I'd post as I do and, you know, just stay frequent and, and, and they would continue to see the posts we made every day. And then finally we were at a, at a function in our neighborhood, you know, a year later and both the husband and wife came up and said, Brad, like, we totally understand what you do now. We had no idea. Like when we build our next house, like you're going to do our house. And so to your point, Jesse, is that it's again, going back to that, you don't have to oversell yourself or, um, be over, um, excited about this is my role. This is what I do. Here's my scope of work. Social media is an avenue where it's that to complete a sale, you need seven, you need 11, you know, hits of that visual before you, you hit the purchase button. And so it's just a constant representative of your brand, of your scope of work, of what you do so that people know if I want to hire a videographer that's really talented or a photographer, I'm going to call Jesse. If I want to build it for my house, I'm going to contact AFT, right? And so it's that c- continual repetition that you're in front of them in a very non-confrontational way, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, and s- more and more studies are showing that it's actually taking even longer. You know, there there has to be, you know, it's it was like, you know, two or three or four in the beginning. It went up to 11, 12, 13 points of contact. And now... We're looking into like 28, 29, or 30 points of contact before an individual makes a choice on buying something. 
And in the situation of like you and your brand, it might be hundreds or thousands of points of contact before somebody goes, now we have the ability to build a home. Because your your product isn't something that like a branded Bill's hat. You know, like I can make a remorseful decision on purchasing a hat really quickly, but I can't make a really quick decision on buying a house or building a house. It's a two, three, sometimes four year situation. So it's like you're really being, you being on social media vets you every single day that a person sees you and is reminded, I want Brad to build that home. Someday, you know, years down the road, when I have the ability to, we're going to do this kind of thing. And I love that because it is true. I mean, when I think about it, am I buying Maui Gym sunglasses or, you know, a hat, as you mentioned, Brandon Bill's hat, you know, the, the purchase price, the lead time, maybe a couple of weeks, you know, for me to get it, you know, a year could be two, three, four years. And there, there's a lot of other circumstances, but, but the key is, as you mentioned, I mean, as you start thinking about this, it can be overwhelming. I know a lot of people that I've consulted with and spoke with about their social media branding. Brad, I don't see traction. It costs a lot of time. It's the long game, as you mentioned. This isn't something where I'm going to post something today and I'm getting a phone call tomorrow for someone to build the house. This is, you know, it's continually putting out information so that you're building this bandwidth out there, that ripple effect, so that, yeah, in three years from now, five years from now, six years from now, someone that built a relationship hopefully makes that phone call one day to, hey, Brad, build my house. So, Jesse, as you're consulting with companies, where do they start? Where, where would you tell someone to focus, no matter their field, but specifically architecture, design, construction? Is there a platform they should focus on? Is there a group? I mean, how do you, not giving away all the information you know, when you consult someone, but how do you help them decide what platforms, if any, they should be on? I first try to figure out what their personality is like. So for you and your brand, you are super comfortable with being in stories, in reels, putting your face to the brand. Like it's not Brad Levitt brand, it's AFT construction, you know, but ultimately if if you didn't want to be the face behind the brand, then we would have to figure out a different way to build that strategy. Are we going to do videos where there's nobody on camera, you're just showing projects and maybe you're talking, you know, overdubbing in the background, you know? So whenever I sit down, I try to figure out, is there a personality, you know, or an individual within the company that wants to be the face of the brand? Is it the owner that wants to be the face of the brand? And are they going to be comfortable on camera? Because you don't want somebody that's really uncomfortable on camera. And when we first started doing video stuff, I would say you've definitely excelled at being on camera. Um, But ultimately, we need to figure out who wants to be that face or what type of product do we have? Do we have a hat that you can get into the hands of influencers that can rep your brand for you? Do you want to be a a more silent brand? Like there's, you know, for Coca-Cola or Pepsi, there isn't a face to the brand. They'll put the product in the hands of influencers. influencers. And if those influencers are repping the brand, then they're doing their job. So we have to figure out what type of representation we want to have on social media. So I would say it's important to have Instagram. It's important to have LinkedIn. It's important to have TikTok. I I go back and forth on Facebook, honestly. I don't know. I don't feel like it's a good representation of four brands anymore. I feel like there's too much red tape to get through to be able to get a good like presence on social media on that platform. Um, I think. Instagram, you could still grow a little bit, obviously, organically. TikTok is good. LinkedIn, I'm super happy that they haven't changed anything. <laughs> they, they, they seem to be a great source for people to grow organically there. But when I'm consulting, 
we need to figure out who is the face if they want to be the face and are they trying to sell the product only or are they trying to build a long-term relationship with the people that follow them and that's the thing is like you're not looking for anybody to buy from you you're just informing people of the process and so when you're on stories or in reels and then you post a photo you're going to have that engagement because people know who you are you know you got done posting a bunch of stories about your family reunion so people feel like they know you are you do you want to be that brand that everybody knows who you are kind of that cheers mentality or do you want to be a brand that only just pushes their product and that's and that's what we need to figure out when we're sitting down with specific brands and trying to figure out their social strategy. It's really smart because there's not a right way to do it. I mean, the reality is every brand has their own success story, whether they're really personal behind it, whether it's just, hey, product placement, whether they're using influencers, whether they're just controlling their own content. So there's, and, and as you mentioned, it's diagnosing exactly what it is, the messaging, the personality, the dynamic that you want to put out there, the privacy. I mean, there's a lot of factors, right? So as you're looking at that, because one of the unique advantages you have is you have a vast knowledge of social media, the platforms, you know, how they can function for the company. But then you also, the back end side, you're doing photography, you're doing videography, right? How did you get into photo, video, and how has that helped kind of build your brand and business? So it goes back to like childhood. My grandfather uh, was a professional photographer in Indianapolis. He had a portrait studio, took pictures of people, and I have- All digital camera work? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally digital. A <laughs> little yeah. bit different back then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, his studio was actually probably about as big as the room that we're sitting in now. And I remember there were just lights everywhere, pointing in every direction for different styles of portraiture. Um, but every time I went to Indiana, I got a camera in my hand. So from the time that I was, you know, three, four, five, and then he passed away when I was 12, and then I inherited all of his cameras. And, you know, from the time that I was, a, you know, a young teenager, it was either playing music or taking pictures. That's all I cared about. And so um, that's how early it started for me. And then I got a digital camera in my, let's see, in my early 20s and started taking pictures of bands. I wanted to be a band photographer. Um, and so I started doing that and I didn't see any success with it. I was like, how am I supposed to charge these people? I wasn't really happy with the results to begin with. And I didn't like- It seems really difficult though. If you're trying to photograph bands, just the la lighting, lack of, the movement- the people, I mean, it's really hard to capture, I yeah. would imagine, and then edit and, and create that in a way that's... Well, and think, think about this. This is back in like the early 2000s, like 99, 2000, 2001, when digital cameras were not as cool as they are now. So you have no idea what you <laughs> shot until you are developing well, it. And like your, your, your image size was so small at that point that it wasn't even a good quality photo. No matter what, like whether you were really dialed in and knew what you were doing, you weren't getting a good result no matter what. And so it was just like, it was a complete waste of time in my eyes. And I was still at that point, very much film, you know, like film photography, SLR cameras, where I was processing, you know, in a dark room and editing in a dark room, like you're, you're processing the film and trying to dodge and burn and all of these different techniques that you would actually do in true photography you know something that like ansel adams would do and it's like nobody does that anymore and so you just kind of become an expert in digital photography and then you know how i started in video it's it's actually pretty funny my one of my good friends from my childhood was a worship leader at a church. 
And he texts me one day and he goes, hey, do, does your camera do video? And I was like, I think so. <laughs> and he was like, sweet, my church wants to hire you. We'll pay you $600 a month and we'll get you a computer and you can do all of our video announcements. <laughs> and he goes, you want to do it? And I was like, I don't even know how to do this. <laughs> But sure. But sure, yeah, let's, let's go. Fi let's figure it out. And so the church had a green wall in their building. And so we used that as a green screen. And I learned how to green screen and key out people <laughs> and do all of these like motion graphics and stuff like that. And that's how I got started. So I, I got started. I had no idea what I was doing. I knew that I had to press record. And that was about it. Well, how much is the editing side? Because getting B-roll... Getting content, taking good videography is important, but really what separates, in my eyes, people that are really good is the ability to edit, right? And the time behind it. I think most people don't realize, I know you made a comment to me that when you go do a photo shoot, people say, do you do video too? And you're like, yeah, but here's the cost. What? It costs more? I mean, like it, it walk people through just the difficulty and how much time goes into editing video as opposed to photography. Well, it also depends on the type of video that you're trying to create. So, you know, videos that we've done in the past where it's just like a talking head, that could take me 15 minutes to put together a quick video where we're just punching in and out of a couple of clips. Um, but then when we get to, you know, 20 minute videos of a video tour of a house, man, we're we're talking i've i've spent 3 or 4 days putting something together so you know 16 to 24 36 hours in some cases like i've totally undersold myself in a lot of situations because i'm like oh yeah that shouldn't take me very long and then i'm like oh my goodness I think we all have that issue same thing with building <laughs> i think it's going to go a lot faster than it really takes yeah and and that it it varies so much and it really depends on, you know, with the video content that we create, you and I, I'm, there are so many different variations of content. There's you on camera, there's B-roll, there's a tour, there's, hey, we're trying to help this demographic. We're trying to talk to, you know, customers. We're trying to talk to GCs. We have so many different pieces of content that we're doing. It it varies from, you know, video to video what kind of time I'm I'm spending on them. But it can be, you know, like I said, 15 minutes or 36 hours. Do you like one more than the other? I like content that brings value. So if we're if we're talking about, you know, something that resonates with me, then I'm I'm super quick to get it on and get it done. But if it's something that I'm like, really, it's really pulling teeth for me, um, then I, I drag my feet. But I think that that's kind of everybody's situation. Like we talk about it often, like who wants to contact their client and with bad information? You know, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to do that. Um, and so it's like, it, it takes time and it's a grind. I hate that word, but it's a grind. You know, there's late nights and early mornings, and I don't ever wake up early enough. <laughs> well, in construction, <laughs> we're kind of stuck to that, so we kind of have to wake up early. Uh, you know, as far as photo, though, I know you do a lot of architectural, a lot of design, a lot of interiors. Do you do people? <laughs> no, not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so you say not a chance. And, and for those listening, I mean, I know there's a stark difference if you're going to do weddings, if you're going to do headshots, if you could do interiors, architectural, right? Nature. I mean, big differences. Why not people? No matter how, no matter how good somebody looks, they're never happy with the image. <laughs> and it's like, I've, I've never, and, and so early on, so really what started my photography career was my wife. My wife went and hung out with a couple of friends of ours and talked about starting a photography business. Um, and so she went to do research. She went and basically interviewed them to figure out if she wanted to do it herself. And she came home and she was like, 
hey, do you want to start a photography company with me? I had put the camera away. Um, she knew that I loved photography, but she didn't necessarily know that I wanted to do photography full time. And so she came home and was like, hey, you want to start this company with me? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so we started taking pictures of people. And we did newborn photography and we did lifestyle photography. So we did family portraits and stuff like that. And I absolutely hated every minute of it, <laughs> except for the newborn photography. Uh, the newborn photography was really cool, but my wife is a much better photographer when it comes to people than me. So she would like talk to the people and she'd be like, oh yeah, you're doing so good. Smile. And like really interactive with them. And me, I'm like standing there going and taking the picture and she's like, talk to the people. And I'm like, I don't know how. <laughs> and it's like, when I'm taking a picture of a house or I'm shooting interiors or architecture, I don't have to talk to anybody. I could just be me all by myself or I could be talking to an interior designer, but I'm not trying to make them look good. I'm trying to make their product look good. And to me, that's a whole lot easier than trying to take a picture of a person. I did some headshots for like realtors and stuff early on, and none of them were happy. And they were great images. And none of them were happy because they always were judging themselves. And so I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I can't do it. We photographed one wedding, and that was it for me. I never needed to do that again. It's way easier and way less stressful taking pictures of homes or video for homes. Sign me up all day for those. Well, I think the value here is, I mean, all of us understand, you know, there's certain clientele, there's certain projects, there's certain scopes of work that for whatever reason, they're not a great fit, right? And so to be successful as a company, to be successful in your field, you have to really understand not only the demographic, like we mentioned, how to market to that demographic, how to use the platforms that are out there, but really hone in on your wheelhouse, on, on what you're really good at, and make sure that you're vetting, and, and that's what you're portraying, right? And this goes back to Nick Schiff and I with NS Builders talk about this all the time, that you know, for him, he's like, Brad, I was marketing these cabinetry details and these remodels, and what did I get on social media? Remodel leads and cabinetry leads. And I didn't want that. I want new home builds. So you have to understand that for you, Jesse, if, if you're going to market yourself in architectural photography, you can't be posting headshot photos. You don't want to confuse the audience. So there is a lot of strategy, as you mentioned, to understand how you want to use the platform and then make sure you're addressing exactly what you want to achieve through that messaging. Yeah. And that's, and that's the most important thing is when, especially operating inside of the world that we live in today, you can be hyper, like, niche or niche. I never know which way to say that. But either way, like, the most important thing is to identify your target market and really hone in on it. Because if you don't put out the content that you want, then you're you're not going to get the people that you want. Does that make sense? It does. So how have you seen, I know that you're very active, you know, in researching analytics through all the platforms. How have you seen YouTube be a benefit to a business? Should all businesses be on YouTube? Yeah, I think so. Because it's it's another opportunity for people to see you. So in your situation, Man, it's been a struggle growing that channel. But we also have to remember if the right person finds that channel and that is the tipping point for them to make a decision on using you, it makes your sales pitch a whole lot easier than anything else. You know, you don't have to convince them of who you are and what you're doing. They already know. They can go to Instagram. They can go to LinkedIn. They can go to YouTube. And it's consistent all the way through. You're going to get different variations of content 
from those channels because it's important to note you can't just plaster the same piece of content on all of the different channels that you have. Now, LinkedIn and Instagram, you can to a certain extent. But ultimately, you can put different pieces of content on different platforms and it's going to help sell your brand even better than you just trying to convince them. I love that you shared that because when you think about YouTube, and, and I'll give a good example. We had, um, even though when you look at maybe the follow ratio, the vanity metric, right, <laughs> as you called it, there's a stark difference in all of our channels, right, or all of our platforms depending on the demographic there. But the value I've seen, so with YouTube, we had a client that we were introduced by the architect, the designer, and they went on. We had an interview set up for middle of the week, earlier that week before we met. They're from out of state. They actually went on and found our YouTube channel, right? So the husband and wife end up watching, you know, 10 YouTube videos. And they were topics that were important to them, interesting to them that we had spoken about. And when they came into the meeting, they're like, hey, Brad, we feel like we know you. And so, yeah, they could get that to some extent on Instagram, but YouTube's a little bit longer format. You know, they can understand my candor, my tone. like. And so by doing that, they felt a lot more comfortable in that meeting. And they said, hey, we watch a YouTube station. So it wasn't so much just a follower ratio as it is, hey, there's value there that they got from watching these to feel more prepared for that meeting. And there was a personality now that we... Have, have built on, right? There's a relationship because now we can build on that. And then you turn that into, you know, YouTube is owned by Google, right? So then the analytics sharing and all the information as people search, hey, why do I need a general contractor? What is an ICF home? If I want to build a home, what's the process? So as you start talking about these, it can integrate, help you with keywords, AdWords as people search Google, hey, I need a custom builder in Scottsdale. I need a videographer in Phoenix, right? And you start building that. Yeah. And ultimately, like, even though we have a smaller following or subscriber base on YouTube, it actually, the subscriber count isn't the important part. It is important to get to the level of monetization. But once you monetize, the subscriber count isn't all that important, ultimately. And Honestly, in in my opinion, if you're actually trying to do business and you have a product that isn't you making videos on YouTube, then the most important thing is getting the content out there so that it solidifies who you are in the market. And if you if you put yourself out there like those like those client those clients that came to you and was like, "Hey, we watched 10 videos. We feel like we know you." that contract right there totally pays for all of the videos that we've put out on YouTube hand over fist because it brought in and closed a deal and made people feel comfortable with who you were that you didn't even need to convince them. And that's when you're building a brand that's pretty personal. You know, I would say AFT Construction is the most personal construction brand out there it it makes a difference it it helps people make a decision hey when we move to arizona or when we have the ability to build a home we're going to him not because of all of the things that he posts we trust him to complete the job which in the world of general contracting is quite possibly the most difficult thing it's it's funny you said that. I was just on a panel at the Tech Summit in Seattle, and we were there with two well-known builders, you know, KB Home and uh, was one of them. And, and they were speaking about one of the biggest issues in our industry is trust, right? And the clients have this lack of trust in construction, which is valid for a lot of reasons, right? There's a lot of contractors that have not held up their end of the bargain when it comes to performance and reputation and communication and all the things in our business. And it's an industry, it, it's really odd when you look at construction because in this day and age, 2021, it's really one of the only industries not affected by Silicon Valley, right? Which is really rare. I mean, they've pretty much impacted you know, travel, 
social media. I mean, yeah. healthcare. I mean, whatever it is, they've impacted. And construction is is still fighting that to some extent. And what's interesting is that you can still utilize these channels to build that trust. I mean, the, the reality is we've made mistakes. I've, I've been transparent on my channel about that. We've made a lot of mistakes. I've sat down in front of customers, tell between the legs, hey, we should have handled this different. We didn't communicate this right. We've made this issue. So we're not perfect by any means, but I will say that by being out there, um, I am letting the customer know and the, the potential future client that, hey, I have nowhere to hide. Like this is important to me. It's important to our reputation. And I, I will be here at the end of the day to make it right. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's interesting. Earlier today, you brought it to my attention that we had something wrong on the channel, on the YouTube channel. <laughs> and I was like, totally my fault. Like that was my mistake. I, I want to own up to that when there is something. And when you put yourself out there on social media, like you do, you are saying, look, I'm going to be here through thick and thin, and I'm going to tell you when we made a mistake, and we're going to own up to it. Not only am I going to tell the client, I'm going to tell you guys, because we want to make ourselves better. We want to step up. We want to be the best you know, contractor in the valley, so we're going to own up when, it's, when it comes down where rubber meets the road. So why did you live in a bus? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you probably right. didn't even know I was going to ask you that question. No, so. I didn't. Um, so I lived on a school bus at 1978 GMC Bluebird. My, <laughs> <laughs> so my, my friends and I, um, from what we understood, we were offered a record deal through- <laughs> From um, what we understood. <laughs> right, right. That, that's I, a, <laughs> I love the context you're, you're setting. So this is just put into place. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So we had a manager- and the manager said that we had um, basically like a record deal offered to us from three different record companies, and we chose to go with Columbia Records. So if you know who Columbia Records is, you'll you'll find this fascinating. Yeah, it wasn't that the one we could su- subscribe to, and you pay ninety nine cents for a CD, and you get ten free ones, and then you pay. Well, dude, your you got to think this is this is back <laughs> in the early two thousands. This is like two thousand four, so this is still CD territory. We haven't even jumped into the world of streaming. Um, basically, we became, we became a well-known band, not super big, but we became a well-known band. But our, one of our contingencies for the record deal was we had to go out on the road and play 35 shows across the country. So we booked a bunch of university uh, shows, and then once we got out on the road, um, our manager notified us that all of our university shows were canceled. <laughs> and so he's like, hey, so don't come back for a couple of months and you have to complete the 35 shows before you come home. And so we lived on a bus, a, paint, a painted blue 1978 GMC Bluebird powered by propane. So hold on, before I get to that, help me understand. So you actually booked these, why were they canceled? Um, because we didn't have the right insurance policy to perform at the university. Yeah. So we needed like some like million dollar insurance policy yeah. to be able to perform at the university. My management, our management team didn't want to pay that. Right. Pay and so premium. we lost, <laughs> lost those venues. We so lost, now here you are. We lost like 25 shows. Um, and so we only had 10 booked <laughs> and we had to come up with 35 more while we were on the road. Um, and so, yeah, we, we went from, and by the way, school buses are never supposed to leave the state that they're placed in just so, you know, <laughs> because we got out on the road. One, we thought, oh, this is powered by propane. So we're going to make good gas mileage. We thought 35, 40 miles a gallon. We were getting three miles a gallon. <laughs> that was a huge, huge hit to our pocketbook. Yeah, it's a hit to the budget. <laughs> and so... Our first show was in like Northern California, in Bishop, California. Oh, I don't yeah. even know where I, that is. I know where Bishop's at. It's in the middle of nowhere. But. <laughs> so, so he put us in like the smallest towns across the country. Um, but we ended up completing the, you know, we, it took us a couple months, but we went so from- So you lived in a bus traveling around for two months. Yeah. And it, it was fun. We, we pulled out all the seats and we put in two couches and a love seat. So we slept in it. We had all of our gear stored in it. 
we painted all the windows black so you couldn't see in. <laughs> and we got pulled over in Winnemucca, Nevada. That was fun. And we learned that our registration was expired. <laughs> but we didn't get pulled over the rest of the time, and we did not register the vehicle. Um, so we went from you know California to Florida and back, and we never exceeded 55 miles an hour. It was a nice slow jaunt across so the country. So did you actually sleep on the couches and, and oh, the yeah. sofa, not on the floor? Yeah. And then it was cool because we were actually playing churches all over the country. And so once we got into the South and the Midwest, the churches were like, no, don't sleep on your bus. We've got an apartment built into our church. And so they would stick us in the apartments and stuff like that. So, so you could three, actually get a shower. and Yeah. So my three band members and then our tour manager. Um, you know, we all slept in the same room in these apartments and we played churches all across the country. It was super fun. But when I think about it, I was like, man, we were crazy. And then we didn't get the record deal. So after all that, you didn't get the deal. I mean, you look <laughs> back though, and, and there are, there's something to be said about just that sense of adventure. Hey, let's go pursue our dream. Let's try this. Who knows? Maybe it sticks and we take off. But if not, you have some great memories as you look back, you know, how you've cultivated those memories and I'm sure those friendships. Yeah. And it's, it was super fun. Like who, you know, we made tens of dollars. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that while <laughs> we, we, tens of we were, we were gone for two, two and a half months, like solid, like didn't come home. And I'm pretty sure we made um, $250 or less. <laughs> But well, that that sounds pretty similar because like if you watch the documentary about In Sync and stuff like that, like In Sync and the Backstreet Boys and like the guy that managed them totally was a swindler too, and he he paid them like a thousand dollars, and they're like, we just went on a world tour. Where's all of our money? Yeah. <laughs> so I guess it's all relative. We made two hundred fifty bucks. They may have made ten grand and. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you were able to feed yourself. You had a place to stay. You were able to travel around the country, see some amazing places, meet some neat people. And, and we were never are, without, right? man. That was yeah. the best part about it. Like, we, you know, in the middle of the night, I was driving the bus and all of our belts blew. And so, like, I'm driving down the 40. You know, imagine we were actually in Arizona, just outside of Holbrook, Arizona, yep. driving to Oklahoma. And I'm driving. And all of the belts just blew. And I was just like, it was just driving. And then all of a sudden, it was just like, <laughs> and I was like, what just happened? And so we had to call a tow truck and we figured out that, you know, what was, what was wrong. They towed us into a, you know, a truck station and we were so poor that they basically gave us tools at the truck station to fix what we needed to fix. Yourself. Ourselves. I have no idea what I was doing. My friend knew. Um, and that, it worked out. But, you know, if I was, you know, I have four kids now. So if I was, <laughs> all right, here you go. Have fun. Like, I just, it would have been a panic show for me nowadays. But yeah, it was, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Pers perspective definitely changed when you become a parent yourself. But, you know, those memories are hard to get back and it's, you know, it's a great experience for you, especially kind of, you know, I look at that now, how that's your personality and how you position yourself with your strategies of, of the consulting you do, the marketing, the videography, and right, there's, there's a talent. We take those experiences, you know, for, and, and even the bad ones we can optimize and make good, right, in, in our future endeavors. So speaking of that, what do you have that's upcoming and exciting? Well, I got tons of videos coming out for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, I just, it, it's, a, it's a constant stream of posting. So you may not see me post on my personal accounts, but if you follow Porter Barnwood, if you watch AFT's uh, YouTube channel, you'll see a constant stream of content coming out from me and the brands that I work with. Um, and... Honestly, like I'm a I'm a solopreneur, ultimately. Um, but my goals, and I actually just brought on um, an editor, so I have a, a side project that I'm trying to build up, 
And once that grows a little bit more, then maybe he'll unleash him to, you know, more content. But ultimately, I'm I'm testing the waters of having an employee and going from there. But ultimately, I'd like to get to a place where I have so many clients that I have to bring on people that are, you know, at my level or better than me and give them stable place to work and have a stable um, feed for my family. Well, you're doing a great job because I know even additionally to that, you have a lot of clients that you're doing photography work for and are purchasing your photos because extremely talented. I mean, anyone that goes through our feed, they'll see a lot of your uh, photography there. So where can our listeners find you? Uh, you can find me on TikTok. No, I'm just... <laughs> no, you actually, well, you could Once find you me Once you monetize there. TikTok, you'll definitely be pushing that. Oh, yeah, definitely. I could, I, I think I am on the TikTok creator fund. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jesse Fitton is where you can find me. Uh, so go to Instagram, uh, J-E-S-S-E-F-I-T-T-O-N. Fitton is my middle name. And I don't disclose my last name. That's not true. It's Smith. It's so lame. <laughs> it's so lame. <laughs> but yeah, um, you can find me Jesse Fitton pretty much anywhere on LinkedIn, Jesse Fitton Smith. And se- send me a DM. Yeah, it's been awesome. Thank you for sharing your knowledge about social media and even advertising, how to optimize the pay for play and, and all the information you shared today. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. So thank you all for tuning into the podcast today. And just as a recap, if you check the show notes, They're just going to have all the links for the topics that we discuss. And also one of our favorite features now is the chapters that go through the conversation. So if there's certain topics you want to revisit or listen to, they're outlined by the time that we discuss those. And again, we can't thank you enough for all of your support. Please make sure and download our podcast, subscribe, give us a five-star rating and review wherever you download your podcast.